let's get into the word. Can you put your hands together for the worship team tonight? Amen, amen. I want you to open your Bibles to the book of, uh, let's start with Matthew chapter 5 and verse 48. And uh, I'm excited to preach tonight. It's going to be a good night. I feel like God's given me a word for us. And uh, I've been blessed these past few weeks. Pastor preached an amazing message on Sunday morning. If you haven't heard that, make sure you get that on YouTube. I'm kind of inspired this word tonight. I figured out that if your dad's a preacher and you got all of his preacher's uh, messages on tape, you don't ever got to study again. It makes, it makes this job a joke. Um, no, I'm just kidding. But he did inspire this word tonight. And uh, I want to preach from this thought, it's whose I am. It's whose I am. And I want to preach tonight on the idea of your identity and coming to know and recognize who God called you to be. Amen. Do we have that first? Uh, John chapter 13. Let's start there. And then if you, oh, did I say John chapter 13? Matthew chapter 5 verse 48. And then we're going to go to John chapter 13. Let's do Matthew 5 48 first. And I'm reading from the message Bible here. The Bible says, grow up. Isn't that a good way to start? Some of you just got the word you needed and you're good to go. Grow up. You are kingdom subjects. Now live like it. Live out your God created identity. That's a scripture y'all need to hold on to tonight. Amen. Amen. Bible says, uh, John chapter 13, verses 1 through 17, this is a story of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. We actually don't have to read the whole thing. Let's just read from, from verse 12. He says, then he said, do you understand what I have done to you? This is after he washed Peter's feet. You address me as teacher and master, and rightly so. That is what I am. So if I, the master and teacher, washed your feet, you must now, y'all good? Y'all in the right place? John chapter 13, verse 12. I heard someone say they got it wrong. You good? Message Bible, message translation, praise the Lord. And rightly so, that is what I am. So if I, the master and teacher, washed your feet, you must now wash each each other's feet. I have laid down a pattern for you. He says, what I've done, you do. I'm only pointing out to you the obvious. A servant is not ranked above his master. An employee doesn't give orders to the employer. If you understand what I'm telling you, act like it and live a blessed life. Aren't you glad that we have an example of how we are to be and how we are to live and how we are to act in Jesus Christ? He didn't place us on the earth and say, hey, you got to figure it out on your own. He said, I'm giving you a living example. I'm putting it in flesh and blood. If you will do what Jesus did, then through that you will be blessed and live as God wants you to live. We don't have to wonder. We don't have to be insecure about our future. If I do what God's called me to do, if I speak like he's called me to speak, if I think like he's called me to think, if I act like he's called me to act, if I work like he's called me to work, if I will just follow this perfect example called Jesus, then through the following of Jesus, I will become what I need to become. And I don't even have to just say I'm like Jesus. I got to actually live like I'm like Jesus. He didn't say, follow me and I will call you fishers of men. He said, if you follow me, I will make you into a fisher of men. You won't just be a disciple because you call yourself a disciple. You will be a disciple because you live and act and move and breathe like Jesus. And he said, what I do, I am giving you the power by my Holy Spirit to do also. Do you believe that tonight? That means if Jesus laid hands on the sick, then I can lay hands on the sick. That means if Jesus moved into an atmosphere of doubt and brought in an atmosphere of faith and saw a miracle happen in the place where it was least likely to happen, then I can also go into places full of doubt and places full of unbelief and see a miracle happen. Whatever Jesus did, he says, by my Holy Spirit, I am empowering you and enabling you to do. The question is, do you believe that in your heart tonight? Because you can never do what Jesus did and do what God's calling you to do until you know who you are until you understand your identity. I'm so glad that I don't have to wonder who I am. Because tonight, I can be confident knowing whose I am. I don't got to be insecure about my future. I, I walked through a bookstore the other day and I pulled off a book off the shelf. I didn't even look, didn't open it, just pulled a book off the shelf and threw it in the basket. And my wife said, how do you know you're going to like the book? You didn't even look at it. I said, I didn't have to. I saw the name of the author. And because I know the author, 
I know the story is going to be good. Because I know whose I am, I know who I am. I know where I'm supposed to be. I know where, I don't have all the future figured out. Does anybody have their entire future mapped out? But do you know that you're in good hands tonight? Come on, let's lift one of those hands up to heaven. Let's pray, ask God to bless tonight. Father, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your word that gives light and understanding, Lord. Let it illuminate something in our hearts and minds tonight. Touch us in this place. Move us in this place. God, let us be marked and changed. When you gather us together, it's not without intention and purpose. Tonight, God, you are careful about your plan. So, Lord, we open up our hearts to you and minds to you. We are ready to receive. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Give God a shout of praise as you do. Amen. So I want to, I want to preach tonight on this idea of identity. And identity is kind of a buzzword in our culture. I think you're hearing it now more than ever. We have a culture today where people can pretty much identify as whatever they want. And the world tells you, you just got to accept that. And if you don't accept that, then you're the bigot and you're the hater. And we have a presidential candidates as well. Doug to say, that, hey, you got you to just believe when children tell you what they are. And if you don't, then, then, then you're a bad parent. Or you're, or you're a bigot or you're a hater. And I figured out that in a world that can identify as whatever they want, we need a church that is secure in its identity. We need people of God that understand what they truly are. Not what they want to be. Not what they wish they were. But understand who I am. I figured out that who I am and who God created to me isn't always perfectly in line with what I want to be. Sometimes there are things I want to be, things I want to do, places I want to go. Things I want to do, things I want to watch, things I want, my flesh sometimes desires things that God said, hey, that's not you. And so to fully understand what God's called me to be, I have to appreciate and begin to understand whose I am. And I want to preach on this idea of identity because everything stems in your relationship with God, in your life on this earth, in what you do, in what you accomplish in the time you have, everything stems from your identity. Because your identity that you, what you understand and what you believe about yourself to be true, will it determine the thoughts that you think, the words that you speak, the, the actions that you make, the things that you do. Everything understands from the belief or the understanding of who you are. And I figured out that it's God that crafted my identity. It's God that determined who I am and who I would be. Not my feelings, not my emotions. I didn't wake up one day and decide this is what I want to be, so that's what I'm going to be. I didn't let my circumstance or the things around me shape my identity. I figured out that my identity was crafted, the Bible says, before the foundations of the earth. Amen. Aren't you grateful for that? Amen. Aren't you grateful that God didn't set you up and say, hey, you got to figure it out as you go along. Part of the reason that we're having the things happen in our culture today that we're having is we have too many parents who raise their kids saying, hey, you're good to figure it out as you go along and didn't instill in them the word of truth, didn't instill in them knowledge, didn't, inst didn't tell them what they were, didn't make the path clear for them, didn't make the example clear for them to follow. And so we had a lot of children that grew up, especially in my generation, that had to figure things out and craft an identity by themselves because no one started steered them in the truth and no one brought them up in the word and no one led them down the path of righteousness and there was no example in their life to show them what they are supposed to be so they had to form and fashion an identity for themselves and if you're wondering why we're seeing some of the things that we see in culture why people are searching and desperate for identity it's because they were never given an example they never had this idea in their head that their identity was already established so they had to go and establish one for themselves or search in the world or search in culture or search for a mentor or search for a teacher or search for the first person that would give them attention and feed them with knowledge they had to search for an identity because no one instilled it in them they didn't realize that their identity was already crafted, was already formed. Their story has an author. They didn't have to go looking for anything. It was already in them. It was already in the word. It was already to be revealed to them by the Holy Spirit. 
And parents, if you think your job is just to get them to 18 and send them out the door, I've got news for you. Every day your children need you. We need people. We need men of God pouring in to young men of God. We need women of God pouring in to young women of God. We need Elijahs for our Elishas. We need people who will speak and steer people down the path of righteousness. Don't let them do it alone. My, my, my dad was talking a few weeks ago. He was talking about, about, how, <laughs> about how kids grow up and, and, and we have all this insecurity. Parents are so fearful about transgenderism and all of these things happening in culture today that it's causing us to, to look at our children and be scared about everything they do, even in the church today. We're so scared that, because that, like, you see these people get on the news and they say, well, my son was three years old and we noticed he wanted to put on a pink shirt, so we decided to raise him as a girl. And you're an abusive parent and a sicko and a pervert if that's what you do. But that's what you do. My son, the other day, I have a boy. I'm seeing all of this happen in culture. I tend to be a little bit of an overthinker, so I will, I will think about little things a little bit too much. And so I see him in our house, and he picks up one of the girl's Barbies. And I'm watching him. And I'm like, okay, am I going to let the culture tell me that the moment he picks up a Barbie that he might get confused some way along the way? Am I going to rip it out of his hands and put a G.I. Joe in his hands? No. I saw him running around the kitchen with a blonde the other day. I said, he's his father's son. Praise God. I said, I'm okay with it. If, if he keeps going down the, If he keeps going down this path, we're going to be okay. We're going to be okay. Better that than anything else. That's why mommy dyes her hair, son. Praise God. Preachers have a responsibility to preach the word and truth. And I, I really believe that the, our culture, our world, it doesn't need fewer preachers, it needs more. It needs more preachers. And, and we need to start to recognize that the role of a preacher, and I don't say this because I am one, the role of a preacher and the role of a prophet is so needed in this world today because we need the word to pierce through the words. We need the word to pierce through the news cycle. We need the word of God to pierce through the culture. We need someone that will stand up and proclaim. We need people that will shout it till their dying breath. We need men of God who stand in boldness, women of God who stand with honor. We need people who stand with conviction. We need spirit-filled men and women of God to preach the word with every breath they have and say, till my last breath I will do this, even if it's counterculture, even if it's against the grain, even if nobody wants to hear it, I know the word and I will preach it and declare it with all my might. We need more of the word of God, not less. We don't need a church that says, we don't need Christians who say that they don't need church. They can have a relationship with God all on their own. Friend, you can have a relationship with God all on your own. But I figured out the thing about a sheep is that the sheep separated from the herd is pretty much dead. I figured out where predators attack is when they can separate from the herd. You need the person on your left tonight and you need the person on your right. I need someone every once in a while to hold up my arms. I need the body of Christ. I need my church. I need my family. I need the people of faith. I need people that will pray with me and believe with me. I need some men of God. I need some women of God. I need people to dance with. I need people to praise with. I need someone who will have faith with me. God for great things. I don't want to sit by myself in my living room and do me and Jesus by myself. I was made for the body of Christ. People were made for people and people were made for God. If God wanted it to just be you and him, he would have made it just you and him. You are both the Adam nature and the Eve nature. Eve was created for people. Adam was created for God. You were created for God and people. Amen. You don't do this on your own. This isn't something that we just all go in our retreat to ourselves and have our own little personal relationships with God. You need it, friend, but it's the body that makes us strong. It's the herd that protects one another. It's the pe We come together and we become mighty in God and mighty in this world. Amen? Amen. I haven't even preached a single note of my message, y'all. <laughs> we need preachers. That's where I was going. Preachers, I think, I think, you know, I, I think most preachers would agree. They would say, if I could just go up there and just preach God all the time, I would just talk about God. I would just talk about the greatness of God. 
And man, if I could just go up there and just talk about God, just talk about Jesus, just talk about the Holy Spirit. If I could go up there and just do that, then that would be the greatest thing in the world. But that's actually not what preachers are called to do. Preachers are called to talk about God. But we're also called to talk about other things. Sometimes we got to talk about you. And frankly, I'd rather not talk about you. I'd rather just talk about God. But sometimes we got to talk about you. Sometimes we got to talk about the kingdom of God. And sometimes we got to talk about the culture of the world around us. And I know this because we had the greatest preacher who ever lived who laid down an example for us, Jesus. Jesus talked about God. He talked about the kingdom, but he also talked about the culture. I wish my church didn't get political. This isn't a political church by any means or by any standard. We don't get very political here often, but I tell you what, preachers need to call out the things in culture that stand against the kingdom of God. And we need to be not ashamed of it, of quiet about it. Everyone has their own unique gifts, but every church needs to preach against what the enemy is doing in this world. And so we're called to that. And then we are called to preach to people because Jesus also did it. Jesus preached to his disciples. He called them out. He called them up, but he also called them out. He called them up to a higher standard. He said, you can be these things, but he also called out the things in them that did not glorify him and that could not continue after he left the earth. The greatest miracles Jesus ever performed was the miracle of his entire ministry. The training up of these 12 men of God to become bold and on fire and, and, and unashamed and willing to lay down their lives. And all of them, except for one, died for the gospel of Jesus Christ, died gruesome deaths. Why? Because Jesus trained up 12 ordinary men to become extraordinary men. He got 12 men to believe and, and accept the truth that he already knew, that they were destined for for greatness, that they were intended to do great things, that there was a call of God upon their life, that they played a role in God's eternal will and plan and purpose. And it took years of traveling and working on these men, but they came to understand some even after Jesus had died, some had to put their hands right in his wounds to believe that the message that he spoke was true. But they came to the understanding that what this man Jesus has told us our whole lives is true. What this man has been preaching is true. And they went from there and they spread throughout the entire world and they preached the gospel for the rest of their lives. The greatest miracle that's ever occurred is what Jesus did by training up those 12 men. So the kingdom of God, Jesus would preach the kingdom of God. And the kingdom, I think sometimes people get a little bit confused about what the kingdom of God really is. But the kingdom of God is is both a place and it's a people. It's both a place and it's a people. And if I could put it like this, the kingdom is, is a place that perfectly reflects heaven and a people that per, per, uh, perfectly reflect the king. In other words, Jesus talked to all of you and said, there the kingdom is. Where is the kingdom? They were confused on where the kingdom is. The kingdom is a place where the will of God can move forward unopposed. Unopposed by doubt unopposed by unbelief, unopposed by believers, unopposed by unbelievers. The kingdom of God is a place where the will of God can move forward. And the kingdom of God is a place where the citizens, the people of that kingdom, the subjects in that kingdom are a reflection of the king of the kingdom. In other words, when Jesus, Jesus' kingdom is established and being fulfilled, when he wants to look out on his, when he looks out on his kingdom, he wants to see people that look like him. He wants to see people that talk like him. He wants to see people that work like him and think like him and speak like him. And no one gets to stay in the kingdom if they're not willing to look or become like Jesus. It's called the process of sanctification. Talk about a word you don't hear in church a lot anymore. The idea that even though I just got saved, even though I'm saved, I got to go and put my life through a process. I still got to become something. It's the continual, ordinary, everyday living for Jesus. It's the being refined by the Holy Spirit. It's the development into the thing God knows I can become. It's believing that I haven't made it just because I prayed a prayer at an altar, but God wants to bring me into something greater. Is anybody with me tonight? It's the idea that I'm not perfect, but I'm being perfected, and I've got to submit myself to that process. And so we have to come into this understanding that in order to see the kingdom of God fulfilled on this earth, part of it means I have to go through a process to become what I need to become. 
And so the reason it seems at times like the flesh is winning in our world, the reason it seems at times like the kingdom of the enemy is advancing and the kingdom of God is diminishing is because we have a body of Christ that is not secure in its identity. I believe if for one day the body of Christ, the church, got secure and really believed everything about what God told us we could be and what God says we are, then there would be nothing stopping the advancement of the kingdom. I believe if for one day we really believed like that, in that one day you would see the greatest revival that the world has ever seen. I figured out that on the day of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts, what you had on that day, more than just the gifts of the Spirit, more than just the flame of fire over the temple more than just the rushing wind you had some people that got together and got secure in their identity they figured out that this is who I am and they went out from that place and saw 3,000 people saved in a single day I figured out that if we can figure out our identity there is nothing holding back and stopping what God wants to do amen So you have to understand your identity. And the reason the flesh can sometimes feel like it's winning is because of this misunderstanding that is happening. I want to lay a foundation for a few minutes. Can can you all stick with me? Y'all good? Okay. There's some ideas sometimes that we get wrong in the church. There's some kind of like things that we grow up believing about God, things that we grow up believing about ourselves that I feel like we get wrong. And one of the ideas that we get wrong is we don't understand this simple truth that when God created you, he created you perfect. When God created you, he created you perfect. And we sometimes don't understand that because we have scriptures like that. We were born in sin and conceived in iniquity. But I need you to understand you were created long before you were born. The Bible says you were created in Christ before the foundations of the earth. As far as I'm concerned, I know that happened before 1992, praise God. I was created in Christ before the foundations of the earth. Before God thought of a plant, before he thought of an animal, before he thought of a creature, before he thought of a star in the heavens, he was already thinking about you. And what did, Jesus, what did God do? For seven days, he creates every living thing. He places every, every heavenly body in the universe. He does everything. And at the end of each day, he steps back and he looks at his creation and he says, it is good. Not is we'll get it good later. He didn't say we'll, we'll start here and then we'll put the finishing touches on it at some point in the future. He said, as it is, it is perfect. It is good. God does not make mistakes. God does not have accidents. God does not create anything that is not fearfully and wonderfully made. God created you perfect, but I'm not perfect. So God created me perfect. It says, okay, what? God created me perfect, but I'm not perfect. So what happened on the in-between? God did not create me with anger in my heart. God did not create me with jealousy about my neighbor. God did not create me with envy. God did not instill in me pride. These things did not come from me, but at some point they got into me. The Bible says I was born in sin and conceived in iniquity. And you need to understand that God created your spirit man long before you came into this earth. And your spirit man was created perfect. Oh, give God praise for that. Amen. I love that because he didn't have to create me and destine me and do me for failure. He created me and his intention was that I would be perfect, that everything I did would already glorify him. Just like he created Adam and from when, when the moment Adam breathed his first breath, he was glorified in God. God was pleased with his creation. You need to understand God didn't set you into a world to fail. He set you into this world to prosper. He intends for you to have a great life. That's a wonderful truth to know, but why then do I deal with sin? I was born in sin and conceived in iniquity. And while the spirit of God, man on the inside of me is perfect, my flesh is corrupted. Can I tell you that you're not actually in a battle against sin? The battle against sin was won 2,000 years ago. You're not actually in a battle against the devil. I used to say that when I was a kid. I was like, Dad, why can't we just go kill him? Like, why can't we just go kill the devil? It just seemed like it made sense to me. 
What are we doing in this church every Sunday? We just go kill the devil. It's going to be okay. You need to understand God has no adversary. Do you think the devil is God's adversary? God has no adversary. God has no equal. God is not in a battle. There's no victory God has to win. There is nothing like God. There is no one like God. Nothing compares to him. There is no battle between God and the devil. How could you even, that's like the battle between you and an ant. There is no battle. God's not concerned about the devil. God surrendered man to our own choice. He let us choose what we wanted to be. So I'm getting there. God created you perfect. So anything that God wants to do, anything good in God, it begins in a place of agreement. This is a good thing to write down tonight. This is the second truth. Anything good in God begins in a place of agreement. When God wants to do anything, when Jesus needed an atmosphere of a, uh, to perform a miracle, he had to make an atmosphere of agreement. He had to send out the people who did not believe, and he had to create an atmosphere where people believe. The Bible says, if any two agree as touching any one thing, then it shall be done. The Bible says in John chapter 7, there, there is no disunity and there is no divide in the Godhead between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. There is zero division. The three are one, and they are always in agreement. The the Bible says when he created the earth, he said, let us go and create man in our own image. There is agreement. Whenever God wants to do something, whenever God wants to move something forward, whenever God wants to bring something into your life or into this world, there always must be agreement. God does not move through disagreement. Now, I need you to follow me on this. God enters through the door of agreement, but the enemy enters through the door of disagreement. God enters through the door of agreement. The enemy enters through the door of disagreement. What's this have to do with identity? You're going to understand it in a minute. And the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians that you are mind and you are body and you are spirit. And I know you're thinking there's some people that I think are just body and spirit and no mind. Praise God. <laughs> but what constitutes and what makes a man a man and a woman a woman is mind, body, and spirit. Without any one of those three things, you are not a human or you're not alive. No one of those three things can exist as a human, as a conscious human, without one another. Scientists have tried to separate the mind of a person. They can keep a heart alive. They can keep lungs alive. They can keep a liver alive. They can keep kidneys alive. But you can't keep the mind alive. It will die. Scientists have tried to take the body and remove the mind and see if they could keep the body alive by keep blood, keeping blood flowing on machines and keeping the lungs respirating, and the body cannot exist without the mind. And the mind and body both cannot exist without the spirit because you've all seen a dead body before. Where everything is there, you know, scientists actually believe there's no reason why a body should be dead. There's no reason why a body should not be able to be brought back to life. But time and time again, they try and they cannot do it. Because the mind and the body cannot be alive and conscious without the spirit. Someone say he's going somewhere. So the mind and the body and the spirit, you are a trinity created by a trinity. God enters through the door of agreement. The enemy enters through the door of disagreement. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 12 that Jesus perceived the thoughts of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and had to send them out of the room. Why? Because he knew that because there was disunity and division, he said a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. Wherever there is division, there cannot be life. Whenever there is division, there cannot be fruitfulness. Wherever there is division, God cannot move there. There must always be agreement and there must always be unity. Amen. Someone say, okay. If you're wondering why it is that we gather on, for service and we gather for church, and the first thing that we get, begin to do is offer up praise and worship and spiritual sacrifice to God, the reason we do that is because before anything can advance in the spirit, we first have to bring agreement into this room. I figured out that there is power in agreement. Nothing can happen if we are in a, a place of disagreement. God enters through the door of agreement. The, enter, the enemy enters through the door of disagreement. Now, I want you to watch me here. This gets a little deep for a second, and I'm going to let you up for air. The entire story of humanity is a result 
of disagreement. The entire story of how we ended up with the sin problem. The entire story of God's seemingly separation from man, the Garden of Eden, the fall of man, they call it. The entire story is a story of disagreement. You might say, Pastor, that's quite the disagreement that's taken place. The entire story is a result of disagreement. And you grow up thinking that this disagreement happened between God and man. But I figured out that there's never been disagreement between God and man. That doesn't sound right. It really doesn't sound right. This doesn't sound right, right? Pastor James Cannon, you know, does this sound right? It sounds wrong. It doesn't sound right that you would say there's no disagreement between God and man. No, because God created your spirit man perfect. And your spirit man perfectly pleases him. And your spirit man is always in agreement with him. Someone say, okay. There's never been, the enemy has never been able to get in between God and man. Doesn't sound right. I know it doesn't sound right. I had to wrestle with it myself. The enemy can't get between God. And, how can the enemy break up a relationship that God started? Who gave the enemy the authority to get between your relationship with God and man? Who gave the enemy the authority to get between this perfect relationship between God and Adam? Do you know the enemy tried it for 40 days in the wilderness with Jesus? He tried to see if he can get in between Jesus and God. Jesus was the true and better Adam, and he failed every time. He tried in the Garden of Gethsemane to see if he could get between, if he could create division between God and man. And Jesus said, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, let your will be done. And he couldn't even get to the point where Jesus was about to die a gruesome death. He couldn't create disagreement between God and man, even at the cost of his own life. I know this is a mix-up in your theology and what you've been believing your whole life. It's a mix-up in mine. But hear me, God, the enemy has no power to break up a relationship that God began. Who gave him that? Who, you think God can start something and the enemy can finish it? It's God's relationship with man. Man was created for God's glory, God's will, and God's pleasure. But somehow, something fell apart. Something had to change. Someone say, okay. So there had to be disagreement at some place because disagreement is the doorway for the enemy. The enemy found his way in, but I'm going to challenge you tonight. He did not get between God and man. He found division in another place. He didn't find division between God and man, so he looked for division within man. In other words, the, the, the division is the enemy's doorway. Disagreement is the enemy's doorway. Am I right? He found a way in, and he could not get between Adam and God, but he could get into Adam. He could find disagreement not between God and man, but within man himself. You are a trinity. You are mind, body, and spirit. The way God created those three natures within you is to work together and to work in agreement. Someone say, okay. The mind and the body and the spirit must at all times work in agreement, but somehow the enemy was able to find division. I was walking through the woods around my house, and there was this one area that was super thick, and I had to get through the woods. I don't even know what I was doing out there. I'm thinking I'm going to find or discover something. There's nothing. It's boring. I'm walking through the woods. I'm out there. I'm like, how do I get back? Praise God. I'm walking through the woods, and I'm looking for a way through, and it's thick, and I can't get through these trees and through these woods until I find a little deer trail, and the deers had walked through this trail so many times that they had created a division, and through that division, through that divide, I was able to make my way through. A couple weeks ago, we were driving up through Georgia and you don't see hills and mountains down in Florida, praise God. But we got to this hill and the, they had completely excavated the center of this hill and created a highway, created a divide. And so where there is a divide, something can come through. Now the Bible says very clearly, I know this is sick, y'all okay, you good? The Bible says clearly that the enemy entered the world, sin entered the world not through God and man, but through man. It had to come through man. Why? Because man was the vessel that God had given authority to on the earth. 
And so in order for any power, for sin to have any power on this earth, sin had to come through man and into the earth. Are y'all follow me tonight? It had to come through man. So the enemy had to find a place of divide within man. And I'm going to challenge you to consider tonight that the place where he found division within man was between the spirit and the mind. And you have felt this division every single day of your life. The reason Adam, I always wonder, I, you know, you're a kid and you ask these questions. You're an adult and you ask these questions. How could a serpent get into the garden? How, how would God let them in? Why would God let that happen? Why would God let the enemy in? How could that happen? The enemy can't do anything unless a door is left open. The enemy is not a threat unless a door. You know what I figured out? Serpents don't have hands. You left a door open. And can I challenge you to consider that in your life, there may be some areas where you've left some doors open. There may be some things where you've let the enemy make his way in. You didn't see it for the threat that it was. You left the door open. There was a relationship that you let a little disagreement and you let the whole relationship break down. And nothing has felt right from that day since. You left the door open and the enemy made his way in. Church, if you leave the door open, you are leaving a pathway for the enemy to break into your life. You left it open in your walk with God. You left it open by not praying enough. You left it it open by not being in your word you left it open by having disagreement in your home disunity in your home and I feel like God's saying that there are some doors that you need to shut in your life there are some areas where you need to say I'm going back to that thing and I'm fixing it. I'm making it right there are some people you need to forgive there are some things you need to let go of there are things, some people you need to go back to them and apologize no one shouts for this kind of stuff there are some things you need to make right because you think you moved on, but you didn't. You left a door open and walked away. And the enemy's been in your life. And you're wondering why there are other areas of your life where things are not going the way you hoped they would go, where things are falling apart. Friend, there are some doors open in your past that you need to close. It's under the blood, but you still need to make it right. Amen. Don't leave any doors open. Can I get an amen? Amen. And so your mind, body, and spirit, but this division happens between the mind and the spirit and you have felt this division every day for your entire life paul talked about it he said i do what i don't want to do and i don't do what i should do paul the apostle one of the greatest theologians that ever lived the man of god paul the apostle he was struggling with division and disunity within himself Y'all follow me? We're the only creature. I, I've never seen a tree wonder if it's a tree. I've never, seen a, I've never seen a dog get up in the morning and think he's a cat. We are the only creature in all of creation that is in disunity with himself. We, there is internal disagreement in the, li, in the hearts and lives of man. Paul said, I do what I, do, I, I, I don't want to do, and I don't do what I know I should do. He said, my spirit is willing, but get this, my flesh and my mind is weak. We are the only thing in all of creation that has the ability to choose our own path and we have disunity and chaos within ourselves and you feel this disunity and chaos every day. And by the way, your body deals with the consequences of this disagreement. Because if I hooked up a polygraph to any one of you and I told you to, take a, uh, to say a lie, your blood pressure would rise and your heart would begin to race and your pupils would dilate, and your muscles would contract, and your blood vessels begin to contract, and your mind goes into a frenzy. These are all the things that happen physiologically when we lie. Why is that happening? Why, why would God create, why would that be happening? It's because your spirit man is saying we shouldn't do this, and your mind is saying we should do this, and your body is caught in the middle dealing with the consequences of disagreement. That's a good word. You, you got to understand your body is dealing with the weight of sin. I wasn't going to go here, but I'm going to go here. When you have a corrupt enough mind, like some of the people in this world, it shows in your appearance. It reveals itself in the way you look. Cleanliness is next to godliness. And I... 
There are certain, if you go to like, if you see these people that are doing these protests and these far, far left crazy things, they hardly look human. I'm not trying to get a laugh at you. Their, 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 their appearance is off. They do not take care of themselves. Their hygiene is off. They do not respect their bodies because they don't understand their identity. They, what's worthy of respect if I have no idea? They do not understand that their body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Their body wears the weight of sin. The number one killer in America is heart disease. Why? Because of stress and anxiety. And it afflicts men more than anything else. The number one killer. Your body is dealing with the weight of disunity between the spirit and the mind. The mind, the body, and the spirit, God created them to be in agreement. The spirit man always knows who I am. The spirit man knows who his father is. The spirit man every day of my life is saying, Brandon, today you are a child of God. Brandon, today be reminded that you belong to somebody. Brandon, today your future is secure. Brandon, today you have a plan and a purpose. Today, Brandon, you belong to somebody. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. Brandon, that's who you are today. But every day my mind wakes up and did and does what, the, what uh, Eve's mind and Adam's mind did. He said, I do not want to accept the identity that my spirit man knows, but rather I want to craft my own identity. Isn't that exactly what the enemy said? Can't you be like God, Eve? The enemy said, I, I, I can go craft my own identity. I can go and exercise my authority and dominion in this world. I can go be what I want to be. But friend, you can never have both. You can never pursue these two identities. Your mind is coming into Agreement. This is the process, by the way, that we are all in each and every day. The testing of my faith that is producing perseverance. The eternal weight of glory that Paul the Apostle said we are being prepared for. We are being refined by the, fires, the, 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 the refiner's fire to become what God wants us to become. And what is the thing that is changing? What is the thing that is submitting? What is the thing that is giving up the fight? It is my mind. The Bible says it is the carnal mind of man that is at enmity with God. It's the carnal mind that disagrees with God. It's the carnal mind that doesn't want to admit that I am a child of God and wants to create and craft this identity for me. And identity is a powerful thing. Y'all got five more minutes? You good? Identity is a very powerful thing because identity can become a protection against the things of the world as well. I was watching the Olympics have y'all watched any of the Olympics, praise God? I hope you didn't watch those openings, but the, the athletes are incredible, incredible things. I was watching this uh, Sydney Thomas or Lavrone McLaughlin. I don't know her name, crazy name, but she's a runner. I was watching her run and she is, she is, I love what she said. She said, I could care less about the gold. It means nothing to me compared to my relationship with Christ. Ooh. Amen. But she was just like fast, 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 fast. fast. Now I've... I've been running the past month or so. <laughs> Why? 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 Like, I didn't even say anything yet. I just said I was running. Hope you're all laughing with me, not at me. I've been running the past month or so, and I didn't know you could run so bad. I didn't know any human could run as bad as me. I, I was running, and... I was running the other day and I felt like my hands just went off timing with my legs. I didn't even know you could, I, I, I play the instruments, I play drum, I got good timing. I was running and all of a sudden my arms started doing something totally different. I looked like a marionette puppet or something like that. I've been running the past month. I checked my watch today, it tells me how much I've been running. I've run 20 miles in the past month. Sounds like a lot, probably isn't a lot. But I don't go around telling people, like, I, I didn't shake anybody's hand tonight and be like, hey, Brandon Billsboro, runner. <laughs> I was watching that Katie Ledecky and she was swimming, she was doing the four by 400 meter. I can swim, Katie Ledecky can swim. I can swim too. Katie Ledecky can swim and I can swim. But I didn't come up to you tonight and shake your hand and be like, hey, Brandon Billsboro, swimmer. Because just, like, just because I can swim doesn't mean I can just assume that as part of my identity and start introducing myself as that to the world. Now, maybe, maybe if I started running long enough, 
Maybe if I got a coach, maybe if I developed in this thing, maybe if I pursued this thing, maybe if I went aggressive in this thing, maybe if I went really hard into running and devoted my life, maybe then I could craft an identity around it. And maybe at some point I could begin to say, Brandon Billsboro, runner slash pastor. But I can't. Because I feel like I haven't done enough to earn that title. I haven't crafted my identity around that. Y'all following me tonight? So identity can be a very powerful thing because people become consumed and fixed on an identity and then identity can secure them in life. Are y'all following me? And so it becomes a form of religion. They don't know, not, not that they worship it or anything, but it becomes a system of protection. That's what a religion is, a system that acts as a barrier or protection from the world, but ultimately lacks spiritual power. Okay. And so you'll notice this, this crossover between professional athletes and Christian and, and belief and faith. For many professional athletes exude the qualities that you look for in a Christian. Have you noticed this? They example the qualities that you look for in a Christian. Hardworking, diligent, honest, committed, consistent, faithful. They show up when they need to show up. They do what they need to do. Has anybody ever been around some athletes? Some of the most incredible people. You watch these Olympic athletes and you hear them talk after and they seem like the most wonderful people. There'll always be some weirdos in there, but wonderful people. They exude qualities that you'd look for in the life of a believer. That's the power of identity. Identity can be a defense against the things of darkness. It can be a, a defense against the plans of the enemy. Why? Because the runner's not going to let them get distract themselves get distracted by the things of this world because it doesn't fit their identity they've crafted for themselves. Y'all following me tonight? Is this good? You can't, you can't be a professional runner and then get into a lifestyle that, that would take away from your running. Their identity is so secure. So identity is a very powerful thing. Now, here's the problem with the church. I'm bringing it to the church now. We have developed this identity of Christian. We are Christians. Can I tell you, the word Christian is not in the Bible. The word Christian is a way that, I, that man identifies people who walk with God, right? I love the word Christian. I am a Christian. I love it. But it is a way, a term we use to identify people who walk with God. And I'm going to tell you, you can be saved and not be a Christian. You can be saved and not be a Christian. Getting saved is just your fire insurance. Just enough to keep you out of hell. But a Christian, I've learned, is something very different. I've learned that a Christian is something miraculous. A Christian is something extraordinary. A Christian is something you don't encounter as often as you think you do. I figured out that there are a lot of Christians in church only by title and not by actual lifestyle. But the Bible says that we are to live out this faith in word and in deed. That it's not just something I say I am, it's something I do with everything within me. And we've gotten comfortable because we've crafted an identity in our mind that does not follow through in our actions. We do some of the things that Christians do. We talk some of the way that Christians walk, talk. But you're doing those things out of an identity that you've crafted in your mind rather than by the spirit man convincing your mind and your mind coming into the revelation that I do these things not because Christians do them. I do these things because my spirit man has refined my mind and that's how I'm moving forward. So there's a difference here. There's a distinction here that we need to get because we have generous people in the church and understand when I'm saying this, I'm saying this as people who believe themselves to be these things and call themselves these things. But the Bible says you will know them by their fruit it's not what I say I am. It's what I do. Well, Pastor Brandon, it's not by works. It's by faith. So no matter what I do, as long as I believe. Really? Read the book of Revelations chapter 2 when Jesus is speaking to the churches. Every single statement he begins. To the church in Ephesus, I know your deeds. To the church in Laodicea, I know your deeds. To every church in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, he begins, I know your deeds. I know exactly what you've been doing. And the Bible says he judges the works. Y'all following me? 
You're innocent from what you don't know, but when you know that what you're supposed to be doing, now you can be judged by it. And there are people in the body of Christ that are pretending that they don't know. Oh, I didn't, I didn't know about that tithing thing. Shut up. Yes, you did. You knew about it every day of your life. You've been ignoring it. You've been quiet about it. You've crafted an identity for yourself that says you don't need to obey it. You know it. You know the word to be true. But you've convinced yourself in your mind that you are something that you are not. And you will know them by their fruit. You'll know them by what they do. You will know the Christians by what they bring into this world. I'm just focusing on me and Jesus. No more of that. You will know them by what they bring into this world. And so we have generous people who have never given. Faithful people who are inconsistent. Bold Christians who have never told anyone about Jesus. Soul winners who have never won a soul. Men of prayer who don't pray. Worshippers who don't worship. Praisers who don't praise. Servants who don't serve. Kingdom builders who only build their own kingdom. Hard workers who don't work hard. Honest believers who are dishonest. Loving people who don't love the sinner. Joyful people who are miserable. Patient people in a rush. Kind people who hurt everyone around them. Christians by title and word but not by deed. Namers and claimers but no livers and doers fig trees without figs because you have crafted an identity for yourself based on what you think you are and what you'd like yourself to be and what you wish you were but you are not submitting yourself to the process to become the things that God has said that we are supposed to be so rather than submitting and rather than becoming you believe the lie that you've convinced yourself of and the world does not need one more Christian by name but it needs more Christians by deeds where did Jesus say the kingdom of God was he said when you cast out devils in my name there is the kingdom of God it's not just what what I believe church it's in what I do it's in what I do and I'm closing with this Jesus kneels down at the disciples feet he washes their feet because he has to show them that it's not just in what you say it's what you do it's not just in what you wish you were it's what you do if you haven't won a soul to Jesus you are not a soul winner if you don't give generously I'm not talking about the tithe because the tithe isn't giving if you don't give If you don't have a lifestyle of generosity, stop convincing yourself that you would do it if you had the opportunity. You have had the opportunities. You're not generous. I'm not preaching at anybody. I just got to preach what God gave me. You cannot keep convincing yourself you are what you think you are because you adopted the title of Christian at some point in the journey and you begin to believe that you were co-opted with it and you become what God wants you to become because you hang out with other Christians. Sometimes you're just around somebody else's fire. It doesn't mean you're on fire. Sometimes you're just around the right company. It doesn't mean you're contributing. You need to be fruitful in this world. Why did Jesus... Why did Jesus curse the fig tree? He didn't curse the fig tree because it had no fruit. I'm sure Jesus walked by a thousand trees that day that had no fruit. They weren't in season. Why did Jesus curse the fig tree? It wasn't because it didn't have any fruit. He cursed the fig tree because the fig tree was a liar. (laughs) And here's what it was. He was expecting a fig tree, but it wasn't a fig tree. It wasn't a fig tree because it had no figs. Are y'all okay with this? I don't, oh, it just didn't, it, was just, it just wasn't in its season. No, it wasn't a fig tree because it had no figs. And it's not an apple tree if it doesn't have apples. Well, it's genome. It is an apple tree. It's just not in season. No, it's not an apple tree until it's bearing fruit. Are y'all following me tonight? It's not a fig tree until it's bearing fruit. Some of you calling yourself with something that you're not yet because the Bible says, I will know what you are based on the fruit that comes out of your life. You can stand in this room tonight. I want to close with this. This is just a little instruction. The body of Christ, the church needs to be really, really, really wise. Can you all lean in for two more minutes? Really wise. The church needs to be wise because we've told ourselves that 
and convinced ourselves that we shouldn't be examining people's lives and looking for things. We shouldn't be doing any of that. The fact is you actually should be looking at people's fruit because some of you are receiving from people that don't actually bear fruit. Someone that posts a thought on Facebook or posts a rant or posts a message, the church should do this. The body of Christ needs to do this. People need to do this. I want you to be wise and discerning because if you don't got fruit, I don't care about your words. I'm tired of people speaking into my life who don't have, I don't receive it, or speaking to the church. I've got the message that people need to hear. The church needs to do this. But when you examine their life, they have no fruit. Are y'all following me? People without fruit, what I produce and what I'm doing is the platform that allows me to begin to speak into people's lives. I watched a preacher the other day, people were going on and on about it because he washed the feet of his entire congregation. Oh my God, look how humble he is. Look how wonderful he is. He watched, how hum- humble of him. He's got seven cameras on him while he washes the feet of his entire congregation. And all this is going on and three months later, the board of directors of the church puts out a message that he's been having a years long affair in his marriage. I figured out, that it doesn't matter what you do when everybody's watching. It doesn't matter how many great messages you preach. It doesn't matter what you do when there's cameras on you or any of those things. You will know them by the fruit that they produce. If you examine my, I invite you to examine my life. I'm not up here preaching a message I don't apply to myself. Behind me, you'll find that there's a wife who is honored and respected, that there are children who are brought up in the ways of the Lord. I'm not perfect by any standard, but I respect and honor other people. I lift up people. I try every day to do my best and crucify my flesh and cancel pride. I am in a mission to become perfected in my life. I am on mission to become what God wants me to become. I'm not preaching one thing and doing another. And friend, it's about time you start to say, God, I mean business with you. Is there a belief? in this place who means business. God, I mean business with you. It's not about filling a chair anymore. It's not about opening my Bible once in a while. Friend, if you don't get into church, every time the doors are open, get serious with God. Get in the word of God. Get in prayer. Become a Christian. Because these are the things that Christians do. We want agreement in the body of Christ. It's about time we started to walk like an army. Not 20% of people doing 80% of the work spiritually. I'm talking about 100% of the people come into this room and begin to pull on God and believe for faith and miracles. Believe that God can do something. I'm talking about coming in onto a Sunday and not having to stir up the body of Christ. You should already be stirred up in the spirit. I'm talking about people who pray in the spirit every day. I'm talking about people who believe and confess and prophesy. I'm talking about people who stir up the gifts of the spirit of God within them. This is what the Christians look like. And you won't see things like what you see happening in culture when the body of Christ begins to move in power, when the saved become Christians. Come on, can I get an amen for that tonight? Have you received something from the Lord? I pray you have. Amen. I'm gonna invite pastor if he'd come. Come on, can we lift a hand up to heaven all over this room? Father, thank you. For this word tonight, thank you for your sweet presence in this room. I pray you'd seal it upon our hearts, Lord. And Lord, let us never doubt that, God, you have called us to an eternal plan and purpose, Lord. We are created in your image, God. Fearfully and wonderfully made. We give you all the glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name, amen.